Hi, this is John, and the following overview contains what I believe is irrefutable, incontrovertible evidence that an end time sign and wonder is taking place that is going wholly unnoticed by the body of Christ. This event is placing all believers in great peril. And if you've been unaware of this event up until now, I don't believe God holds you responsible. However, now that you're being alerted to this event, I believe a great responsibility is being laid upon your shoulders to give this serious consideration. This event represents one of the most significant events in all of human history, as well as church history. Yet, the majority of church leaders have never heard of it, and if they have heard of it, they are dismissing it without serious consideration or review, primarily because of a misinterpretation, I believe, regarding the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture. Now, many in the church are not aware that the Bible clearly prophesied this event that I'm talking about in numerous passages in both Old and New Testament. Here are just a few that have foretold this event. First of all, you have Daniel 7.25, and these are all treated in detail in another overview that I've done on my YouTube channel. Daniel 12, 20, uh, 12, 4 and 12, 9, Revelations 22, 10, Amos 8, 11 and 12, Revelations 13, 2 Thessalonians 2. The evidence to support that this event is taking place is therefore backed by the authority of scripture as well as six other separate forms of proof which i elaborate in detail on my youtube channel wake up or else the evidence that i'm about to show you is so obvious and so compelling it's so easy to see that it seems that the only way that you can come to the conclusion that there's nothing to see here is that you're bewitched or you're willfully ignorant or you're suffering under a form of extreme cognitive dissonance that causes you to have an irrational knee-jerk reaction to reject this assertion early on without any thorough review and i'm asking you and begging you not to do that right now if you choose not to review this entire transmission, it'll be primarily because you'll dismiss this as an impossibility because of how you view the doctrine of the preservation of scripture. And there are many, however, within Christian orthodoxy that do not agree with this interpretation that the Bible teaches that scriptures cannot be changed. This group holds that although the Bible teaches that God will never change, and his eternal words will never change. This group holds that these are distinct from scripture, the terrestrial Bible. And we see that Jesus made this distinction, for instance, when he said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you find eternal life, but they are those which testify of me, the word of God. I treat this topic separately in another overview as well. And I would just simply ask you to have an open mind right now and review the information on this video before you decide to make a final decision. As it's written, Proverbs 18, 13, he that answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. So having said that, what I propose right now is that I will give you one scripture after another. And what I know to be true, because I've done it over and over, is that many of these passages will be completely unfamiliar to you. They will be so foreign to you that it will be shocking. And in that moment, you will be forced to make a choice. Do I trust my memory and my intuition, my gut? Or do I rationalize what I'm experiencing because of a long-held doctrine? And ask yourself, has God never messed with your theology and completely turned and upended your theology through 
his influences upon your spirit through experience, through events. I mean, what if this is true, what I'm saying? Is it not worth it just to take a few minutes and review the evidence for yourself on the outside chance that this is actually happening? All I'm going to do is quote scripture. So get your King James Bible and prepare to pause the video so you can see these passages in your own Bible, your grandmother's Bible from the 1800s, as I ask you the questions, because you won't believe it until you see it with your own eyes in your own Bible. All of the quotes that I will be sharing will be from the Cambridge edition 1611 King James Version only. And as we review these together, you will have to come to one of two conclusions. Either you are just misremembering 30 to 40 scriptures, or somehow, through the use of black magic, some advanced technology, and supernatural influences, your terrestrial Bible that sits on your shelf is being supernaturally changed by the enemy of God. It's the only two options. Are you ready? Jesus, speaking to the paralytic, told him to arise. Take up your blank and blank. I ask you to go with your memory. What does it say? Because in Luke 5, 24, he told him, arise, take up your couch and go into your house. Most remember that he told him to take up his bed and walk. I'm not going to elaborate on these, that couches weren't invented. The earliest etymology is like the 1600s. The couch was invented like the 1800s. I'm not going to get into any of that. I'm only appealing to your memory, your conscience, your integrity, and you and the Holy Spirit saying, God, is this really happening? Because outside of that, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. But here it is in the Cambridge version. This is not a, um, a modernization. You know, the King James has been modernized. This is not a confusion with other translations. Many of these changes are in all translations, as I will show. Okay, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I comes, the latchet of whose blank I am not worthy to unloose. Now, if you said sandals, and you're reading the King James Version, then you're in, in the majority, because that's what most people remember. However, Luke 3.16 now says, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. So what we're seeing is many words, modernized words are appearing in our Bibles, which we're very unfamiliar with. Now, this is obviously a very enigmatic scripture. It's from the book of Isaiah. Who will lay down with the lamb? What animal lays down with the lamb in the millennial reign? If you said the lion, you would be in the majority. However, if you turn to your Bible, Isaiah 11.6 now says wolf. And you'll find that the wolf is in every translation known to man. Here it is in the 1611 Cambridge, even all the way back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, some hold this as proof that we're only misremembering because they show how far back it goes. It's in all the commentaries. But this sign and wonder is many, many, many times more exotic than you could even imagine. Because what we're proposing is that all of history has changed while our memories have not. This, of course, is unfathomable, yet that is what we're experiencing, and this is millions upon millions of people. True believers who walk with God for decades in the Word, serving God, are making this claim. And in the mouth of two or more witnesses, let all things be established. So we cannot be dismissed as biblically literate, uh, charlatans deceived we are not willing to be brushed aside any longer 
we're begging the church leadership to come forward, to come out into the public square and debate us, talk to us, and stop treating us like heretics. Okay, this scripture is quoted by saint and sinner alike all over the world as, judge not, blank, ye be judged. And of course, if we're talking King James, you would think it was lest, however, the King James Version, and of course, every version, does not contain the scripture, judge not, lest ye be judged. It does not exist in any translation whatsoever. And when asked, how could this be, the naysayer will suggest that there has been a kind of cosmic telephone game take place, that somewhere along the line, some preacher misquoted it, and of course then the entire world picked up on that and has quoted it incorrectly. If you've ever been in the street preaching, the sinners will always throw this up in your face, judge not lest you be judged. It just it strains credulity. It becomes statistically impossible as these scriptures mount one upon another. That so many people could get it wrong. In other words, if you're a if you're a expert Olympic archery expert and you're standing fifty feet in front of the target, it's it's unrealistic to suggest that you'll miss five out of ten completely. You'll probably hit the bullseye eight out of ten. And you are a Jedi when it comes to scripture. So when I say no man putteth new wine into old blank, and you turn to Matthew 9, 17, and it says bottles, it's jarring, it's shocking, it's unfamiliar. It's also um, doesn't make any sense if you take the term bottles at face value, which are solid, the whole idea of this passage is that a wineskin is made of a cloth or a fabric type thing. And if it gets dried out and cracked, then you try to put new wine and it ferments, it'll burst. Well, bottles wouldn't do that. So the scripture not only is unfamiliar to our vivid memories, it no longer makes any sense. And it's in the original 1611. It's not a modernization. It's not a translation issue. Okay. And furthermore, <laughs> what we find over and over is what we call residual evidence to where it will say bottles in the, in the Bible itself. But when you go to the commentary in the back of the same Bible, it'll reference wineskins. And so I think you can begin to see that those of us that are making this claim are not wild-eyed, weak-minded stooges that are being tricked by uh, Photoshop gimmicks on the internet. We are conducting hundreds of hours of research and prayerful consideration of this issue. And we've come reluctantly to the conclusion that the Bible actually has foretold this event, and we're now experiencing it. The problem is that most of the church is like when Rhoda came to the door and knocked because Peter was at the door and she ran back and told the people that were praying for Peter to be released that she was crazy. It was a supernatural event that she was reporting and she was correct, but she was called crazy. And that is what those of us that are trying to sound this alarm are experiencing. How many times did the cock crow before Peter denied Jesus? Of course, if you're in the majority, you would probably say three. However, now in Mark 14, 30, we hear that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And of course, this wording of being denying thrice is very unfamiliar. But certainly that the cock would crow twice is extremely unfamiliar. There are other passages that indicate that the cock crowed three times. And you can, you can bring any commentary you like to explain these anomalies. 
but it's irrelevant because what I'm appealing to is your conscience. Your memory does not agree with what you're reading. Your conscience is troubled. You're vexed. And you have residual evidence to support your vivid memory. And you have a growing number of these that seem very unfamiliar. And these are three of the proofs. We have seven now. And verily, verily, I say unto you, except a blank of wheat fall into the ground and die. What is what is in the blank? Did you say a grain of wheat? Because that's what I remember. Except in your King James Bible, in John 12, 24, it now says, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. A corn of wheat doesn't make any sense, but of course, you can get into that. Corn wasn't introduced in the Bible lands in those days, but I don't care even about those kind of proofs. I'm just appealing to your memory that this was not in your Bible. See, Christians don't just read the Bible like they read a novel one day, you know. They live in the Bible. They study the Bible. They memorize the Bible. They go to hear people speak about the Bible on a regular basis for their decades. So it's very insulting when we read these passages like this that are so foreign to us. When we've devoted our lives to this book, to suggest that we're just misremembering. Okay, and it gets worse because many of the changes that we're seeing now are clearly inconsistent with the character and nature of God and the doctrines that we have held to be true. Now, this is one example. There shall be two men in a blank. Where are the two men and the two women? Well, Luke 17, 34 paints a very interesting picture. I tell you that, I tell you in that night, there shall be two men in a one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. Now, these two word pictures paint a very disturbing picture to many of us. Why are two men in a bed? And why are two women grinding together? And then, of course, I don't remember the fact that it's supplemented by this. Then saying there'll be two men in a field. It was two men in a field and two women grinding. Grain. <laughs> and so you could see that this scripture seems to have been changed to reflect let's just say the LBGT uh, worldview. Okay, we'll see more of this as we go on. To your recollection, in all of your years of seeking God and his word, listening to sermons, the patriarchs of the faith, teaching on the doctrines of angels, to your understanding, now listen very carefully to my question, is there any passage of scripture that even remotely suggests that there is such thing as a female angel? Yes or no? Come on, quick. Yes or no? Of course you're going to say no. Maybe you're not. But Zechariah 5.9 is very, very new to very many people. And my, my question to you is, if this is the first time that you've ever come into your knowledge that there is such a passage that even remotely indicates that there might be female angels, how is that possible? How could this have escaped your notice your entire Christian life? Then lifted I up my eyes and looked and beheld there came out two women and the wind was in their wings for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. I've read the commentaries. I've heard the responses to this. I don't care what explanation you have, that they're not really angels. All of that is irrelevant. My question was very specific. 
to your knowledge, are there any passages of Scripture that even remotely suggest that there are such things as female angels? And if you said no, then that becomes a proof that the, perhaps the Bible has been supernaturally changed because you never knew that this was in your Bible? Come on. And I know this is happening to you right now because I've done this over and over with men of God and women of God who have spent decades in the Word of God. And when I ask them the question, to your knowledge, is there any such thing as female angels? They always emphatically and quickly said no. Yet, we're looking at a scripture that clearly suggests that there is. And you can go find the commentaries on it. And you think that's proof that this is just false memories that we're misremembering. But it's not, because the commentaries have changed. History has changed. This event is a mind-blowing sign and wonder. And until you dedicate some time to really research this, you won't understand how far-reaching this is, to the point where Paul was inspired to describe this power that the enemy would have in the last days as having all power in Second Th Thessalonians. He will have all power to commit lying signs and wonders. Well, in my theology, only God was invested with all power. But yet the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to give the enemy of God that reference, okay? Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the blank? Okay, here's three or four passages that where we start to see modern words in our King James Bible. Where did they put their money? They put it in the bank. Luke 19.23 and it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the blank. This is a, a group of people. Of course, Jesus left the caravan, was somewhere in the temple, and he's in the midst of who? Well, if you said the Pharisees, you'd be in the majority. But Luke 2, 46 says he was in the midst of the doctors. Sounds more like he wandered into a hospital. And in that day, he which shall be on the housetop and his blank in the house, let him not come down. It's talking about his possessions. What was the word that you're, comes to mind? He which shall be on the housetop and his possessions. Well, it has the word stuff. Now, strangely, this, by the testimony of many believers, this was the scripture that really triggered them to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, the Bible says that they had their stuff? <laughs> I mean, like, in other words, how crazy does it have to get before you will have to admit that something unexplainable is happening? Here's another modern word that we see in the scripture, show me, or shoo me, a blank. Whose image and superscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. Show me a, it's a coin. What was the name of the coin, right? Most people would say a denarius. Luke 20, 24, in your King James Bible says, shoe me a penny. I mean, if that doesn't rub you the wrong way, I, I'm not really sure if I, can, if I can even help you. Because a penny? He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the, he's talking about Jesus, we found the blank. I'll give you a hint, it starts with an M. Did you say Messiah? Because if you did, you'd be in the majority. However, in John 1, 41, it says we found the Messiah. I know, I know. It's translated differently in the Old Testament to the New Testament or whatever whatever commentary you want to overlay on this. But what I'm saying is, what does your memory tell you? And is this the first time that you've ever noticed that it says Messiah? Jeremiah is Jeremy. Noah is Noe. I mean, all of these people's names have changed. It's just 
unfamiliar. And, you know, at a certain point, my name is John. I know the name of the street I grew up on 40 years ago, don't you? You know your math tables? You remember your next door neighbor's name? I'm not confusing the Monopoly guy with the Platter's Peanut guy either. Okay? Confabulation. It's nonsense. Your memory is admissible in the court of law. You can send somebody to prison for life with your testimony. All right, think about this and just let it go. My people blank for lack of knowledge. Perish, right? But it says destroyed. And if you look, there isn't one translation that says perish. My people perish for lack of knowledge. No, it doesn't exist. It's very difficult to accept. If it was one or two, absolutely I'd accept that we're misremembering, but not 30 or 40. Not when I'm talking to people who have lived in their Bible. They've worn out Bibles. They had to get new ones over and over because the ones that they had are threadbare, falling apart. It's got tape on it to hold it. <laughs> it's filled with notes. It's memorized. But yet you're going to hold to the to the... It's like saying your name changed. Your name is Joe and you wake up and now it's Jim. And it's like, oh, and you just accept that. And you're like, no, my name's Joe. Well, here's your driver's license. I don't care what my driver's license says. I know what I know. I mean, you stand on that belief because of, as a believer, when the atheist tries to tell you that there's no God and you're like, Pfft. a man with an argument is not at the mercy of a man with an experience. I know that I know that I know. Well, what happened to that? There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, <laughs> a very precious ointment, and poured it. Where did she pour it? <laughs> she poured it. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but this is really, this is really hard to believe. It's Matthew 26, 7, that she poured it on his head. All right, you remember the story of baby Moses, and when she could hide him no longer, she got a blank for him and coated it with blank. What did she put Moses in, and what did she coat it with? Well, if you said she put him in a basket and coated it with pitch, you'd be in the majority. However, what your King James Bible says is, in Exodus 2, 3, is when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch. And this, of course, is a tangled mess of weirdness because it goes on to say, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. <sighs> I'm not even going to go into that any further. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the blank, against which the blank did vehemently or be vehemently. We all know this parable. What did he build his house on? The man that heareth the word and doeth it not. Did he build it on the sand and the winds came. Well, Luke 6, 49 reads, he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently. Now, <clears throat> in all fairness, in Matthew 7, we have the familiar wording, and you might try to suggest that that's why there's this controversy that we're just confusing the different gospels that, you know, see it a different way or have different word. No, no, because if, if, if in any of the gospels, it says Jesus rode into town in a Maserati eating an ice cream cone, I don't care what the other gospels say, that gospel would jump out and I would know that it was one of the disciples said that Jesus rode into town in a Maserati, right? There, in other words, there would be no problem, me confusing. I would know that's in there. There's an anomaly in there 
Well, here it is, Luke 6, 49. He built his house upon the earth, and the stream did beat vehemently. No. And blank cast down his rod before Pharaoh. Okay, you've been in the Word for decades. You've, you were in you know, Bible school as a kid. This is a very famous uh, confrontation with Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron go in. Who threw down, the, who threw down his rod before Pharaoh? You got a 50-50 shot. Moses or Aaron? <laughs> Exodus 7.10, if you said Moses, you'd be in the majority. But of course, Exodus 7.10 says, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh. King James Bible. All right. Who did Jacob wrestle with? Well, if you're like most people, you remember that he wrestled an angel. But of course, Genesis 32:24 says Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him. Well, you could dismiss it if you want. But if you woke up one day, And your name changed, and all of the data sphere around you, your license, all of your documents, everything, told you that your name is something different. You would be be plunged into the experience that we are all experiencing. And it's worse, because then what's really the most difficult part is the people around you who also see the change but refuse to have any other conclusion than that we're just misremembering. And then they attack you, and they shun you, and they demonize you, and they vilify you, and they emasculate you, and they persecute you. Because you're challenging their worldview, and they don't like it. And so you are ostracized. This is a nightmare, okay? But as you can see, it's not based on a small amount of information. And this is a very small amount. For when I am weak, then what? When I am weak, what I recall and what makes sense is then he is strong. However, what we read in 2 Corinthians 12.10 is for when I am weak, then am I strong? Well, first of all, no, that's not what I remember. And that's not what many people remember. And you can try to dismiss memory as a form of, you know, credible proof that our memories are fallible. But that is a lie. Okay. It is gaslighting. It is not our experience. A hundred people that have lived in the same home for 20 years can tell you exactly who they live next door to. And they're not confusing it with the guy down the street. Period. It's probably 100% of the people, if you take 100 people that have lived in the same house for 20 years, probably 100% of them will get their next door neighbor's name correct. It's certainly not millions of people like are claiming what we're claiming. So I summarily reject the idea that we're just misremembering. There is something happening. And the you know, the the really difficult challenge for us is that the people that are, are I call them naysayers, or let's call them the unconvinced, they are misremembering these just like we are, okay? they You are getting these wrong too, probably. In other words, you're misremembering them. The, the only difference between the two of us is we come to a different conclusion. Many flee to the safety of claiming that we're just misremembering, so they brush it aside like it's no, nothing to challenge the worldview. Whereas we, other, the other camp has come to the reluctant conclusion that, yes, in fact, this is happening. And many of us saw it in, in you know, uh, pop culture, names of things changing, all this stuff. Okay. And if you go, you know, the Our Father who art in heaven prayer, this is really hard to accept that, that so many people have remembered this incorrectly. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? Where will his will be done? Well, if you're in the majority, you would say on earth, but it actually says in earth. 
and then of course it says debts and debtors instead of trespasses and when we've asked folks about this again they've suggested that somebody's misquoted it somewhere and it's like it's called confabulation it's ridiculous <laughs> But those, mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither, and what? This is Jesus telling his disciples to do what? Bring them hither and show them before me. No, slay them before me. Luke 19.27. And I understand that you could try to suggest that Jesus is talking about the judgment that comes after you die and all of the different commentaries, but I don't care because a, I don't remember this, nor do many people remember this. B, in all the 35 plus years I've been out on the streets witnessing to people, especially Muslims, this was never thrown up in my face by Muslims. Jesus was into jihad too. He told his disciples, whoever's not following me, let's kill him. Well, why didn't I ever have that thrown up in my face in the last three or four decades? Anyway, uh, and the gospel must first be blank among all nations. Did you say preached? Mark 13.10 says published. But whosoever believeth in blank, this is John 3.16, he can't even get it right. Believeth in him shall not perish, is what many people would recite if they didn't think about it, but it actually says should, which is not as assertive, it's not as certain. Your descendants will be like the, talking to Abraham about the Abrahamic covenant. What will his descendants be like, beloved? Did you say sand of the sea? How about dust of the earth? Genesis 28:14. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Most people remember nations of the earth. And these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in. This is a place. Where wouldn't he go? He wouldn't walk in Judea. How about Jewry? John 7, 1. For he would not walk in Jewry. Well, when I first read that, I thought it was talking about jewelry and it was a it was a misspelling but it's a twisted bible change because in daniel 7 we were told that the devil would try to wear out the saints you're gonna this is gonna wear you out as you try to make sense out of these scriptures as you're doing your bible study preparing for your sermon on sunday and you're like your head is spinning because you're trying to make sense out of this. And unfortunately, God has allowed this to draw us to himself, to purify his bride, and to get us to stop trying to know him through our head like the Pharisees did. All right, so for blank, we'll pass through the land of Egypt on that night and we'll strike all the firstborn. So who was it that struck the firstborn? What was the name of the entity that came through and killed the firstborn in that classic story many would remember the death angel <clears throat> however exodus 12:12 12, 12 says for i will pass through the land of egypt on that night exodus 12:23 for the lord will pass through to smite the egyptians there's no reference to any death angel yet ask a hunt do this for yourself don't take my word for it Go to a hundred patriarchs of Bible colleges, you know, the Bible president, the Bible scholar, the theologian. Hey, uh, Pastor so-and-so, who, who was it that went through Egypt and killed the firstborn? Watch them tell you the death angel and then do it to 10 more people and let the laws of probability, okay, you want to be all rational about this? Try, try explaining the laws of probability are against you at this point. And it's becoming more and more probable that an end time sign and wonder is happening. Then you're misremembering. Especially since it was foretold that it would happen. <clears throat> 
For where two or blank are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Well, you know, what comes to mind? What's the first impression when you quote that? For where two or more is what most people remember. But Matthew 18, 20 says, for where two or three are gathered together. Do you think it's not possible, but the Bible told you that this was possible? I shared those passages very quickly in the beginning. There's a whole treatment of the 45-minute overview of those passages on my YouTube channel, Wake Up or Else. And you can email me at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com, and we'll have a discussion. I would urge you to do that. Because how do you roll this out to your congregation? This is not happy bells, I can tell you that. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the, where did they put the ark of the testimony? I mean, there's songs about this. I mean, there's just so much proof that what we're saying is true. Yet you can't find any reference to the holy of holies in your Bible. I can't. Maybe I missed it. Exodus 26, 34 refers to it as the most holy place. Hebrews 10, 19 refers to it as the holiest. Hebrews 9, 7 refers to it as into the holiest of all, but holy of holies, uh -uh. it's not there. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the, would you like to say word? Because you'd be wrong, it's a doer of the work. This one, when I first tied into this phenomenon, this one got me to stand up in church and walk out because nobody, the pastor, the assistant pastor, and the assistant assistant pastor didn't flinch when the guy at the front of the room quoted this. And I'm looking around for a man of God to say, well, hey, uh, I think you misquoted that, Joe. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall blank you free. Well, it's set you free in King James. Other versions say set you free. But in the King James, it's make you free. Anyway, and we, all, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are. I mean, a lot of people remember called according to his purpose, but now it says the called. Now, you may remember it that way, and that's one of the oddities of this sign and wonder, that... Similar or people with similar beliefs can still have dissimilar beliefs on certain things. It isn't completely uniform across all people who are claiming that this is an exotic event. So it's very difficult uh, to be dogmatic on these things. But when you are certain about something, like your name, okay, I'll give you an example. I'm going to say a number. Are you ready? The number is seven, okay? Now, what's the number that I just said? You're saying seven, right? And my question to you is, how certain are you that you're correct? <laughs> and of course, you would be 100% certain. So that's certainty. You have the uh, innate ability to be certain about things. And when you have read some of these scriptures, like the lion laid down with the lamb, and you go there and it says, wolf... Your certainty is challenged, and you have to decide what side of that fence you're going to fall on. So did your recollection, did Jesus ever baptize people? Many don't have any recollection of Jesus baptizing people, but of course now in John 3.22, we see this passage. And after these things, Jesus... And his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. How about Jesus praying for infants? Do you have any recollection of Jesus praying for infants? I remember him laying hands on children, but in Luke 18, 15, and they brought unto him also infants. I'm sorry. No. Ah, red lights are flashing. My soul is jarred. My mind is spinning. Uh -uh. No, 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 no. A thousand times no. Okay? I trust my 
intuition, my gut, my memory. I don't, I'm not claiming that all of these are 100%. This one gets close to it. Lion and the lamb, close to 100%. Some of these are 100%. That's how certain I am. These are very jarring passages in your understanding of the scriptures. Are there any, are there any references to nursing fathers? Numbers 11, 12. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, carry them into thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child? And then again in Isaiah 60, verse 16, thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shall suck the breast of kings. Now you may be listening to this and and I'm not being sarcastic. You may have a memory of this going back 20 years. But others may not. Mothers may be seeing this for the first time and being a little taken back by what they're seeing. And if that's you, I'm asking you a simple question. If this is in your Bible, how do you explain that this has escaped your attention all these years? Think about that. Think of the probability of you never knowing that the Bible talked about nursing fathers. An overlay upon that, the absolute impossibility of this actually being physiologically possible. Men don't have milk to give, so what, is, what does it even mean, right? It's very difficult. I think what I would ask you to say to yourself is, hey, John, I don't really believe this yet, but I can understand why you might be a little, uh, you know, towards the believing side, right? And some of these passages are pretty hard to deal with. Like, this is something I never, ever saw these names in my Bible. These people have five and six syllable names. I'm not even going to try to pronounce them, but there they are. I mean, I remember Mephibosheth. That's the only guy with a big name I remember. But these guys have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. 16 letters in their name, some of them. <laughs> All right, and this one is very, very difficult to explain away. <sighs> that in your King James Bible, on just about every page in the Bible, you can find punctuation errors and grammatical errors that are so horrendous that it looks like the Bible is written by a fifth grader. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you can do it yourself. Now, when I have asked learned men and women of God about how this could be, their common response is that, well, that's just King James. So they're suggesting that, that these gross punctuation errors, like you see here in Numbers 11, where it says, whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? Question mark for they weep unto me. So the next word should be capitalized after a question mark, and it's not. So you'll see this all throughout your Bible. And then nonsense scriptures, which make no sense. And you'll see words that are spelled terribly incorrectly. Um, and so the uh, it's put forth that King James is just that way. However, I did a little research and I found that there are um, many books written in the King James style listed here. The Chronicles of the Kings, A Parable Against Persecution, The Chronicles of Erie, the first book of Napoleon written in 1800. And when you go into these books, they are not filled with punctuation errors at all. They, they read flawlessly. So this is a lie. This is untrue. The King James Version, if it was consistent with the King James language, it would be free from punctuation errors, especially if the publishers were made aware of it, which of course they would be. And so this is an unexplainable phenomenon. Okay? Was Daniel a president? Daniel 6.2, and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first. Now, Three days ago, I was watching an old preacher preach at my old church. This is going back 15 years. And he referenced that Daniel was one of three governors. Okay. 
And so I'm admitting to you that I might be incorrect in some of these passages that I was just unaware that this was in the Bible. However, there's another explanation. And that, again, is that when, it, when these changes are noticed by many people, our experience is that it wasn't changed like 10 years ago and before that it was how we remember it. The change means that all of history has changed. So the fact that there was a guy referencing this 20 years ago is not proof that I'm misremembering. It's proof that this is a mind-boggling, inconceivable phenomenon that all of history could change. At least that's our experience. We don't really know how. Most of us do not hold to a multiverse uh, explanation because it's too theologically difficult to explain how there would be infinite number of Johns who will stand before infinite number of judgment seats. That's just uh, theologically too much. Uh, so I don't really have an explanation for what we're experiencing, but I can tell you what it isn't. It isn't misremembering, okay? We're not senile buffoons stumbling around, bumping into walls, can't remember our names. Negative. Negative. Not the case. All right. Does God condone sin? Because now we find passages which seem to indicate that he does. Hosea 4:14, 4, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom. 2 Corinthians 11:8, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And I know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say, oh, it doesn't mean he would rob them. But that's what it says in your King James Bible. So if I'm a thief, I'm going to quote 2 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to go steal some money, right? Proverbs 26.10, <clears throat> the great God that formed all things both rewards the fool and rewards transgressors. Now, I know God's, it says that God sends rain on the just and the unjust, but this is different. He's rewarding the fool and the transgressor. 2 Corinthians 11.4, he that comes preaches another Jesus, we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, <clears throat> which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, he might well bear with him. Eh, it's no big deal. Now, let me just make a statement here. If you're accusing me of being a heretic and spreading doubt about the word of God and that I'm a, I'm a um, false prophet and a charlatan and a threat, sowing discord. I'm just quoting scriptures. And I'm drawing a conclusion based on those scriptures. Now, if you have a different view, I challenge you to a debate, a public debate that will be hosted by a third party and will follow the debate rules. And you can bring all of your views and your convincing arguments and I'll bring mine and we'll let the public decide because we can't get any church leaders to even talk to us. So if you're on your high horse about how we're deceived, why don't you come and try to help save us? Okay? Because I'm I'm really I'm really perplexed by the lack of uh, Christ-like response to this very credible claims that we're making. We're not just shooting from the hip here. As you can see, this is a prepared presentation with a lot of documentation and a lot of stuff to back this up. And it's your own memory that's con that's convicting you, that's telling you, you're getting it wrong, you're getting it wrong. Please, how many times does the Bible use the term pisseth, pisseth against the wall? Now, again, if this was in your Bible, you know, you, you would probably be aware of that. You would have some grid for the fact that it says that. But what I'm asking is how many times does it say it if it's in there at all? What if I told you that your Bible says, talks about people pissing against a wall six times? 1 Samuel 25, 22, 1 Samuel 25, 30, 1 Kings 16, 11. It's right there. All right, how about this one? How many times does the Bible mention unicorns? Now, again, you've been in the Bible for four decades. You would have some idea if your Bible even mentions unicorns. 
and you would know how many times it does. And what if I told you that your Bible mentions unicorns nine times? Would that be a little off-putting for you? Would that be a little bit of a raised eyebrow? I mean, maybe not. Maybe you maybe you're aware of that. How about men eating their own dung and drinking their own piss? Isaiah 36, 12. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Question mark. Next word is not capitalized. Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall that they might eat their own dung and drink their own piss? Okay, do you have any grid for the fact that the Bible teaches that people could bring turtles as a sacrifice in the Old Testament? Does that ring a bell? Does that resonate with you at all? Because what we read in Leviticus 12, verse 6, is that uh, when the days of the purifying are fulfilled for a son or a daughter, she shall bring a lamb for the first burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove. As we read on in verse 8, and if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles. Okay? So what we're reading in the King James Version in Leviticus 12, 8, is God is directing people who are a little short on cash to sacrifice two turtles to him. Okay? Is that kind of a train wreck for you? Is that a little broadside? Does that hit you the wrong way? But it's worse because it does appear to be proof that the Bible has been altered because these two words are the same word in the original language. So you would have to put forward that the translators chose to translate it turtle dove the first time and turtles the second time in the same passage, basically. Now, why would they do that? Now, I've been told, well, the words are interchangeable, turtle, dove, and turtles. No, they're not. That is a lie, and you need to stop doing that, okay? Because it's not true. A turtle dove is a bird, and a turtle is a reptile. And furthermore, if you go to the Hebrew Chaldean lexicon, and you look up the original etymology of the word, there is no reference to a turtle here, okay? So the dictionary definition of this word is a bird. It's not a turtle. So this, to me, is unequivocal proof that the Bible has been changed right here. Because how do you explain that? Maybe you disagree. Let's have a debate. Does the word Easter appear in the New Testament? Yes or no? Well, Acts 12.4 says yes intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. And of course, most people would be more comfortable if it said Passover, but it doesn't. Uh, then we have many examples of these cut and paste jobs in the, in the Bible, where you have two passages in different parts of the Bible that say the exact same thing. 2 Kings 19.12, Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezbah, and the children of Eden, which were in Thelazar. So that says the same thing in Isaiah 37. And we have this very odd reference to the children of Eden. So you have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and now you have these children of Eden. But of course, if I was to say that I remember the children of Edom, E-D-O-M, wouldn't that resonate with you? Are you willing to take a leap of faith? that you're a supernaturalist, that you believe God made Adam and Eve out of the dirt, or he made Adam out of the dirt. The ax had floated, Moses parted the Red Sea, but when it comes to someone suggesting that your Bible is supernaturally changing, you tap the brakes. Who wrote the book of Romans? Now, I told this to one of my friends who's a very learned Bible scholar, and he was aware of this. I never knew it, so it may just be an oversight. But in Romans 16, 22, it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Okay, and I just, I stand by my conviction, because I've done this so many times, that if this is the first time that this is coming to your knowledge, that Paul 
Okay, I understand you want to claim that this guy maybe was a scribe. Paul wrote it, but he had Tertius write it for him because he was in prison. Whatever. Fine. But is the first time that anybody, to your knowledge, had anything to do with writing the book of Romans other than Paul? How about that? Because it was for me. I'm not claiming I'm some great Bible scholar, but I'm just saying I'm not alone. There's a majority of people who are like, what? All right, who cut Samson's hair? I mean, this is every Bible school story you ever went through. And, of course, most people would say Delilah. But now we read in Judges 16, 19 that, and she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. So it wasn't Delilah, it was a man. Judges 16, 19. This scripture, again, was a seminal passage for many people. They feel that it's blasphemous and it doesn't resonate with their memory or their doctrine. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee. Jesus is not a holy thing, okay? That's all I'm going to say. Was Abraham married to Hagar? Yes or no? He was married to Sarah, but was he married to Hagar? In your recollection. I mean, come on, you're 50 years old. You can tell me what the name of the street you grew up on was. And if I asked you, how certain are you of it? You would tell me, well, I'm 100% certain. So what's your recollection on Abraham? Was he married to Hagar or was she just given to him kind of as a concubine type of deal? Well, Genesis 16.3 says, And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Furthermore, what is your recollection about when Abram and Sarai got the news? Who laughed when an angel told them that Sarah would have a child? Do you remember who laughed? Sure you do. If you're in the majority, you remember Genesis 18:12. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? But do you ever remember Genesis 17, 17? That now says, when Abraham, or then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him? Maybe you do remember that. But a lot of people are like, what? What was the bird holding when it returned to the ark? Do you have a, re a recollection of that story with Noah? He sent the bird out, came back empty-handed. Eventually he came back and had something in its crawl, or in its beak. What was it? Well, if you said an olive branch, I think you'd be in the majority. And again, you can do this for yourself. Go ask 10 of your peers. Hey, what did the bird bring back in the Noah story? And it, and. You watch, they'll say a, a branch, an olive branch. But Genesis 8, 11 doesn't say that. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf. Now, this is the next a, a version, uh, an example of these, the words that we're seeing in the Bible now. Plucked, P-L-U-C-K-T. <laughs> uh, no... So it wasn't an olive branch. You're mistaken. You're misremembering. Or right at this moment, you're experiencing an end time sign and wonder where you have a vivid memory of something that never was the case in your existence, your universe, your life. You know, maybe it's an implanted thought. It can't be crazy because you would have to explain how millions of people suddenly succumbed to a physiological disorder simultaneously. That's never happened in history. So that's irrational to suggest that we're all crazy because you're experiencing it yourself. I know that you've gotten many of these wrong because I've done this so many times. Okay, so your, your next go-to thing is demonic influence. Okay, but really none of those explanations 
are rational, especially if they apply to you as well. You don't want to suggest that you're demonic. The, the, the real hinge point of this argument is not that we're m- misremembering. It's the conclusion that we <laughs> draw from the misremembering. So the naysayer or the unconvinced chooses to categorize this in a natural way. Okay. Oh, it's just the infallible human memory can't be trusted. That that whole idea. Okay. But as you go into it and you you see that the Bible actually foretold this, that we actually have examples of things that changed real time and changed back. We call them flip flops. Those are some of the most compelling evidence. It's unexplainable. Then we have the residual evidence, like I showed you with the wineskins. We have many of those. We have the law of probabilities. We have notable people coming forward now. We have similar to you, which is your memories and our memories are the same. Like when the witch was in front of the mirror in the seven dwarfs, what did she say to the mirror? Blank, blank on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Well, every time I ask somebody that, they say mirror, mirror on the wall, right? But the actual movie says magic mirror on the wall, okay? You can dismiss it as trivial. However, sociologists will tell you that if you you have something like over 5% of 100 people get the the vivid memory incorrect, that becomes an unexplainable anomaly above 5 or 10%. And when they did these surveys, asking those questions, it was closer to 95% of the people said mirror, mirror, and they got it wrong. So that is, by definition, an unexplained anomaly. Okay? The, the dove coming back with an olive leaf, if 100 of your peers tell you an olive branch, that's an anomaly. It's not misremembering. You can't go to that argument uh, and be rational. You're being irrational. Does that make sense? I'm trying to appeal to your rational uh, reasoning with something that is completely irrational. Anyway, what is John the Baptist's last name? Now, I phrase it that way because we found in Luke 7.20, when men were come into him, they said, John Baptist has sent us here. (laughs) So it looks like it's his last name, but... You know, this is just very unfamiliar to so many people, and we don't remember ever reading John Baptist. It was always John the Baptist. So this would be John Baptist the Baptist. And, and, you know, at that point, people that are unconvinced will rise up and, and judge us, saying, how dare you? Hold your memory above the scriptures. Well, you err not knowing the scriptures, dear soul, because you're basing that superficial argument on a misinterpretation of the doctrine of the preservation of scripture, in all honesty. And it's time that you came out of the shadows and debated us in public, if that's your conclusion. If if you're still with me at this point, because this is the... To me, one of the most significant, important events in human history, and certainly the church age, the Bible, we're claiming that your scriptures are being supernaturally altered by the enemy of God, and you're dismissing it offhand. That's wicked, okay? I'm not saying you have to agree with us, but you do have to engage us in intelligent discourse and stop calling us names and ad hominem attacks and and just taking going to youtube and looking up mandela effect debunked and you watch two or three debunked scriptures and that agree with your worldview and then you're satisfied to brush us off this is terrible jesus rode into jerusalem on two donkeys matthew 21 and and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they sat him thereon And then last scripture, Peter is naked, John 21, 7. Therefore, that disciple Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. 
Okay, so you've got the wolf laying down with the lamb. You've got the paralytic taking up his couch and going into his house. And you've got Peter running around stark raving mad, casting himself into the sea naked. I'm sorry. Uh, this is extremely foreign to many, 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 many people. And we are here for you. We would like to talk with you for church leader and just review what do you do with this. If this was compelling to you, you can go to my YouTube channel <clears throat> at Wake Up or Else, and you can review a whole one-hour overview of the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture in the light of the Mandela effect. And another uh, overview that I did here, which goes into great detail on all of the passages that foretold this event in context. And you can email me once you've done that, or right now, at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. And I would love to have a conversation with you. Because in the five years that the community has been trying to address this phenomenon, we have been met with uh, persecution and rejection and an unwillingness to see. And then <clears throat> what's more mind boggling is that once we get some church leaders to actually look at it, they can't see it. It's normalcy bias, it's cognitive dissonance, it's a bewitchment, it is a spiritual blindness that we cannot fathom. So I would ask you to give it serious consideration. Let's have a conversation. Let's even have some, some lusty debates in the marketplace in love and go through our proofs that we have and see if we can't find common ground and understanding. Because those of us that are claiming this are being asked to leave our churches. It's breaking up our families and we need your help. If we're delusional, we need your help. So out of the mercy and kindness of God, please reach out to me. And I would love to hear from you.